everyone, uh, this is Lola here, uh, coming at you again with another YouTube video. Uh, this one is going to be particularly interesting. I hope the title grabbed your attention because uh, we're going to be talking about the police and I'm going to talk about it from a revolutionary perspective. Uh, so this video is for anybody who is interested in understanding the police uh, from this perspective. Uh, particularly people who may have just started learning about the police the police system in America. Um, maybe people who have been confused by the phrase, all cops are bastards. Uh, maybe people who already have a little bit of knowledge about police, but aren't really sure, uh, you know, where to go. So I just want to share, share what I know about the police uh, to people who are interested in learning about it. Uh, I also want to relate it specifically to... Um, you know, experiences that I have been having, um, or experiences related to the issues that I'm working with in Sarasota, specifically, that's the community that I organize in mostly. Um, and I'm also going to be using my artworks to explore this. So I have two pieces here that I did uh, in my uh, painting, painting two course. Um, we were tasked with, um, you know, we were tasked with learning how to paint landscapes. Um, so I decided to actually bring some uh, reflection into this experience. I wanted to be, I wanted to make it very personal. Um, it wasn't just a project to me. I, I saw it as, um, you know, something really powerful, something that I could really um, engage with. So the two landscapes uh, that I painted here are uh, of pictures. I use, um, for reference, pictures that I took of uh, real houses um, in the communities that I'm trying to talk about. So the first one is a picture of a house I took of um, in Siesta Key. Um, this is a house where there's a lot of wealth. Um, there's a lot of investment. Uh, it's you know very uh, protected area. Uh, it's just it's a very wealthy neighborhood. And this happened. This neighborhood exists in the same city where neighborhoods like this exist. Um, and this is a picture of a house I took of. In Newtown, I painted it, changed the colors and everything, um, you know, added some of my style to it. I also added the storyline or whatever, the, um, the sunset. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of elements in this piece, uh, but the most essential one is obviously the figures in the front. Um, it's a family and they're experiencing uh, the impacts of the police system. Um, a system that is that was designed and is encouraged to um, target people of color specifically, poor people, um, trans people, um, you know, disabled people. The police force preys on these people um, because it, it, know, it knows that poor people specifically can't, don't have the resources to fight against them sometimes. Uh, we do have resources, we have our work um, that we can do as a community together when we stand up, but when we're isolated, we don't have money, there's, uh, it's difficult. It's definitely a challenge to fight against the police, and the police know that, so that's why they target these communities. Um, so yeah, uh, Newtown specifically is a neighborhood in Sarasota that is being gentrified, um, and I want to talk about in this video how gentrification and po the police system kind of go hand in hand, how over-policing is a symptom of, gen of a gentrified city. Uh, yeah, so you know, that's just kind of a basic... Um, basic view of this painting, but I want to talk a little bit more about this one. Uh, this one, I'm going to cut out some things, I might not cut out everything, so, you know, excuse me if I'm a little, I don't really do this very often, this is like my fourth or fifth video, but yeah, so this video, I want to clear some things, uh, this picture, I want to clear some things about it, I'm going to cut this all out, let me figure it out, um, so this video, this, you're doing great, take a deep breath. All right, so this painting here, I want to draw attention to some issues that it might bring up and my stances on them. I wanted to make the symbols clear, but sometimes um, these things can be misinterpreted. Um, so I want to just upfront say, you know, what I'm saying here with this piece. So what we have here is uh, a depiction of what I associate with the symbol, um, the Blue Lives Matter symbol, which I have painted on this gentleman's shirt and this woman's shorts and I also aligned the children with that symbol too by giving them the same like um, 
kind of color scheme is um, the parents. There's also a relationship to the American flag, um, which you can see through the color scheme that I chose. Um, I also chose to paint uh, a white heteronormative uh, nuclear family. And what I say when I say um, heteronormative is that it's a heterosexual family. You know, there's a man, there's a woman. Um, and that's kind of like what's normal in our society. So it is heteronormative. Um, and a nuclear family is a type of family where there's, you know, a mom, a dad, there's the children. Um, and that, that group is seen as a family. Uh, so that's you know, what I say when I say nuclear family. Nuclear family exists as a tool to keep us isolated from the rest of the people around us. Uh, you may have noticed that in America, in your community maybe, people are not very in touch with the people around them. You may not know who your neighbors are. You might not even met your neighbors. Uh, that's really common in America because so much importance is placed on the nuclear family, your mom, your dad, relationship with those people. And relationships with um, your neighbors, your community, your co-workers, etc. are not stressed. Uh, so that's why we feel disconnected and it's hard for us to feel plugged in with um, the world around us, the people around us. It is also easier for us to be isolated, especially if we are not um, feeling, you know, loved or at place in our nuclear family. Uh, so yeah, that's the nuclear family. And also the people I depicted are white. I want to address uh, why I painted them as white people. Um, I'm not going to say that I believe all white people are bad or all white people believe that the police are, um, you know, good. So my perspective is that whiteness was a construct invented. It did not always exist. White people, the term, did not always exist. Um, it's something that was invented by colonizers, by the oppressors, um, Western society to establish um, a reason why they deserve to be on top, why they deserve to um, take other people's culture away from them, why they, why they deserve to oppress people. Um, and, why, and also it serves as a way for them to um, separate themselves from the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, it's, it, whiteness is a tool, there's so many ways that it's used, but, you know, don't, don't think that when I say white, I mean inherently all white people. I'm addressing the construction of white and how it acts in our society to oppress people. Whiteness is weaponized against us. And I think the more we point it out, the better we can um, fight against it. So um, that's uh, you know, my perspective on you know, those, these things that might be easily mis, um, misunderstood. Um, so let me see what I'm gonna talk about next. I have a little list of things to talk about because I usually get sidetracked. Um, so here we go. Um, I have another thing I want to address that's really important. Um, I know this might be controversial. Um, it's something I'm still working through. This is where I'm at right now, but I think it's important to talk about. Um, so I want to say that there is no way to be a police officer and be someone who believes in justice. And I'm talking about real justice, justice that involves liberation of you know, black people, indigenous people, poor people, disabled people, trans people, there's so many people that our society, society systematically oppresses. So I think justice has to involve them. Um, and I think if you're an active duty police officer, there's no way that you're putting all of your life energy into justice because you're actively giving energy to a system that is used to oppress us. Um, and if you disagree that the system is used to oppress us, um, you're not listening to the signs all around you or you're just you're deciding not to listen to those signs. And both of those decisions are impacting us, the people who are being targeted negatively. So the longer you wait to wake up, the longer you wait, the longer you feed energy into this system, the longer you're, on, you're against us. And um, that's something that you really shouldn't wait to address. Um, I also wanna address that um, I do not believe that inherently all people, so you know, I'm against active duty police officers, but I do not believe that inherently all people who have been police officers are, or people who may even be considering it, are evil people. If you're considering it out of ignorance, if you're considering it because of the propaganda that um, you have been fed since a child, that police are good. Um, if you became a police officer and you know, you're no longer a police officer because you realize what was happening around you um, and what you were serving, uh, you know, I don't believe that 
you know, it's the end for you. I believe that you can still put energy and work into helping people. And if you do that, that shows that you've made that change. If, you ha if you're not doing that work, then you're not, um, you're not actually changing. So that's my perspective right now. Feel free to challenge me if you want um, on Twitter. Uh, not on YouTube. Hopefully the comments are going to be disabled on this because I know some of y'all get wild and it's get wild out here and it's it's really hard to interact with you when you're so full of hate. But if you want to peacefully discuss these things and your alternative opinions on it, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, you can reach out to me at human leech. It's human underscore leech. Um, not because I view myself as a human leech, but because of a beautiful song by Lilo Smith. A beautiful, creative, um, incredible being. Uh, so uplifting Will Smith right now. But yeah, the, the song Human Leech, I don't know, I just thought it was incredible. Uh, I can unpack why later, but it's just beautiful. She's got a lot of other work too. Um, but yeah, reach out to me. I also think it's, you know, I don't know. I think sometimes it's fun to use names that surprise people, you know? Uh, so human leech you know whatever i don't think it's a bad name so you know reach out to me if human leech on twitter if you, if you disagree with this this is where i'm at right now i've had different opinions i've had the opinion that all cops or people who were cops or whatever need to die or whatever but sorry about taking that word no i'm gonna edit that out i've had the opinion um that all people who were cops cannot be changed but i honestly believe that ignorance leads us to a lot of um terrible things and you, you know i i'm not going to say that it's your fault that you're ignorant but at this point if you're receiving this message and you're choosing to ignore it then you're actively choosing to be ignorant so then it's no longer ignorance it's a choice um mm -hmm. so that's my opinion on that uh i also want to talk about um Okay, symbols. Uh, symbols is something that I, want, I really want to bring a discussion about when we talk about police, um, because that's something that is used by Nazis, um, like nationalists, uh, you know, racists. Uh, they use that to show like who's in that community. So I think once we begin to pick up on those symbols, we can begin to know who we're dealing with. Uh, so in this painting, I use the symbol 1488. There's a, a number, a number of symbols that Nazis use. The 1488 is one that I thought I could incorporate nicely, you know, as the address of the house. I also used it um, in the police car as, uh, you know, just the police car number, 1488. Um, you know, so I want to encourage people to be more aware of the symbols around them. Um, when we're dealing with police and, not, and Nazis or whatever, uh, they're using symbols, um, and if we, uh, you know, if we see them, we can begin to, you know, what's going on. 1488 specifically is, um, it, it's something that is used to bring, to remind people of the 14 words that Hitler used in Mein Kampf. Is it not? Oh my god. I, I typed in 1488. He didn't use the words, I don't think. I was, this is the, this is the Wikipedia article. So I don't know what the 88 means, but the 14 mm. the words. It's David Lane. Yeah. The slogan was coined by David Lane, but the phrase is from Mein Kampf, right? Derived from a passage, apparently. Yes. Okay, now I'm, now, now I'm not confused. So now you caught up? Okay. I'm so sorry. No, it's all good. I might keep that in the video. I'm mean, learning. Learning all the time. That's my boyfriend on the camera. He's always on the camera, so that's who's there. Um, the, so 1488, um, you know, feel free to check me on this if you feel like you need to or want to, but whatever. It serves the purpose of talking about symbols. 1488 um, is a symbol used by Nazis. Uh, it was a, it's a reminder of the 14 words that Hitler used in Mein Kampf. Um, these 14 words are, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Um, so it's specifically, it's all about Nazis, you know, white nationalism, the idea that the white race 
which was constructed to oppress people needs to continue and um it's got a lot of really gross stuff in it like if you unpack that you can get some really dark things out of it um but you know basically that's it's about how we nazis need to work together nazis need to fight to be nazis and secure their you know existence as nazis and the continuation of it um so yeah 1488 is a symbol that we need to recognize um and then i also want to talk about the symbol uh the blue lives matter symbol i think i pointed at it in, in the beginning of the video but a lot of people aren't completely aware of it so the blue lives matter symbol is a symbol of it's like a, it's like the, a thin blue line um framed by two black you know two black lines it's right here that's the symbol um and you you'll see it in a lot of different forms you might see it um used with the punisher logo um you might see it used on the american flag like as a black white and blue american flag with a thin blue line going through it um anything with a thin blue line going through it uh, you know, bumper stickers, uh, those are, you know, t-shirts. If you see someone using that symbol or associating that symbol with themselves, they're identifying with the Blue Lives Matter movement or identity, which started in response to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so Blue Lives Matter is not about uplifting all people. It's about uplifting specifically police. And I want to express that when you're uplifting specifically police, uh, you're doing something that, that's evil. If you're doing something that's fascist. You're doing something that's racist. Uh, and you, you should stop. I mean, this is my message. Stop if you're using it. Also, if you see someone using it, avoid them. They are not a good person. Or at least they're not, they're just not good. Okay? At this moment, they're not good. So, if you see the Blue Lives Matter symbol, avoid that person. Um, these paintings were basically about how when I see this symbol, it disgusts me and it makes me think of scenes like this because you can't talk about the police without talking about what they're doing and poor um, and black, uh, you know, indigenous, what they're doing in these communities. Um, yeah, so the Blue Lives Matter symbol is one of the symbols we need to pay attention to. Um, and I, I should make another video where I go over all the various symbols that are associated with um, hate, um, just so we can be aware of them. Uh, some people have them as tattoos, uh, people have them in, in necklaces, uh, you know, knuckle tats or whatever. There's a lot of crazy stuff that people are doing with these symbols, but they, all they're doing is making it, making it obvious for us where they align. Um, so yeah, you know, we gotta use pay attention to these symbols. Let me know if you want to see a video, you know, talk, talk to me on Twitter, at Human Leech, if you want to see a video about all the symbols. I'm not super educated in all of them yet, so give me a, an experience or an opportunity to educate myself on them too. All right, so the next topic that I want to talk about in relationship to police and, you know, being a revolutionary um, is that police are not inherent to our society. This was a big, uh, revelation to me that happened, I would say, maybe around last year. Um, I, I was just really uneducated on the history of everything. I just really hated history in school, so I slept through it. I'm realizing now it's because the history I was learning was whitewashed, uh, history, so that's why I had no interest in it. I guess I, even back then I knew it was lies. Um, but now I'm turning back into history, I'm learning about, you know, the world around me, because knowledge is power. Um, but one of the things I learned was that police are not inherent to society. Not all societies, not all civilizations, not all people, not all states have... I think maybe all states might have police. You can, I mean, you need to do some research on that. But um, not all societies have police. Um, and specifically in America, um, the police system is so revealingly toxic. Uh, if you just do a little bit of research, you'll start to really understand like why the police system is the way it is now. It's because it's always been like this. Um, before there was the police in America, there were slave catchers. These were the people who would catch runaway slaves, um, punish them, bring them back to uh, their, you know, the, the colonizers. Um, so, you know, slave catchers, the slave patrol or whatever is what we first had before we had the police system. Then, 
um, after, um, you know, we were fake emancipated, we were not free from, from slavery, slavery still exists in the prison system, but after, you know, traditional slavery was made illegal, uh, the police force was invented. Um, and the police force took all those people who were part of the slave patrol and just gave them uniforms and um, they were made official by the state. Um, the, and also, you can know, you should know that the police have been infiltrated by multiple hate groups. Um, I know specifically the KKK has infiltrated the police. There's a lot, a lot of content about this on YouTube, a lot of articles, so you can definitely research more about it. Um, but the police are, you know, it's a system that has a lot of, um, you know, hateful people working in it to use that system to, uh, you know, advance their agenda. And it, it's the police system is, is a great way for them to do that because it's always been there to help oppress people. Um, so yeah, basically the police, you know, have not always existed in America. They do not always have to. That's another thing. I, I'm calling for abolition of police and the uh, rethinking of how we can protect each other in our communities. I'll dive more into that later. But uh, yeah, um, you know, before you know, there was even slave catchers and slavery here, um, you know, in, in America, there was indigenous civilizations, and these indigenous civilizations did not have police. Um, when there was an issue, the community worked together to resolve it. Um, we didn't have to call people with guns to intimidate, you know, whatever the threat was, and usually the threat, you know, in our society is, you know, it's so sad, but it's, it's, um, threat is, you know, people of color, just because they say that we're threatening, and just just by existing, we can be identified as a threat by the police. Um, also, mentally ill people um, get targeted by the police, and it's awful because they can't really respond to the orders of the police, so there's a lot of really tragic stories about mentally ill people being um, harmed or killed by the police just because they didn't have the way to respond to them. Um, our police do not specialize in de-escalization. Police escalate difficult situations. So another thing I want to throw out there is don't call the police. Don't call the police. There's no reason. Don't call the police. Don't do it. Um, especially don't call the police on people of color. Like, I don't know. The, o the only people I know who, like, maybe even had a good reason to interact with the police, people who have been, like, abused or wanted to get justice for someone harassing them, um, even then, the police are not helpful with that. They are really just not really helpful at all. Uh, they actually try and make these things more difficult for us. Uh, so, but it's also, it's way, it's very easy for um, certain people of certain identities to use the police for their benefit. So rich white people call the police, these are there right, you know, in a minute, right there real quick to help them solve their issues. Um, sometimes, you know, a lot of times the issue is poor people. Um, landlords call the police to kick out people from um, their houses just because they can't afford their rent anymore, which has been going up, even though our wages haven't been going up. So the issue isn't us, the issue is the wages, the issue is the landlords. Um, so that's another thing. Another video I'll make will be on landlords because that's a lot to unpack right there. But yeah, the police are an ally to landlords and thus, you know, an ally to capitalism. Uh, so yeah, going off on a, you know, a little tangent. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to put out there that the police are not, you know, inherent in society. And we should be, we should feel encouraged to imagine society without police and to start solving issues without thinking we need to rely on the police. Um, also, I want to point out that the police are a tool used to aid gentrification. And that's something I, wanted to, I was talking about in these paintings because Newtown, the community where the police are... Um, harassing people, brutalizing them, and, um, you know, jailing them just for existing. Um, it's a community that's being gentrified. And gentrification, um, I, I need to look up the specific definition, but vaguely gentrification is when um, one group of people is pushed out of an area so that another group of people, um, wealthier people, white people usually, are um, pushed in or encouraged, incentivized to come to that community. Um, so that the business or owners, the capitalists, the landlords, or whatever, can make the most money off of that area. So gentrification is when um, poor communities are systematically pushed from their homes. 
And this doesn't always happen by raising rent prices. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is over policing. Um, what we see in you know, black communities, poor community, Latinx communities, etc., is a terrifying presence of the police that you don't see in these communities, which is why I didn't paint the police in this photo, because it's just they're not really there. And if they are there, um, you know, they're not harassing people, they're not, you know, shooting people who are just like, you know, being with their family. Uh, the police are, you know, helping them with whatever issues they might have. Um, and not helping people, um, not helping, this just, they're not being very helpful in this community, which you can see here. Um, so yeah, uh, the police are a tool of gentrification. Um, and if you want evidence of that, you don't believe me, Newtown is a great example. Newtown is just one aspect of uh, Sarasota. There's a lot of aspects. Um, sorry, Newtown is just one aspect of our larger world. So you can use Newtown as like a reflection of society in general. Um, but in this community, Newtown, the police are not by chance um, in this community. The police are there uh, because they are, they're supposed to be there. They're paid to be there. There's conscious effort by the police force. Um, and I would say even by like, you know, the political system in Sarasota to keep police mostly in Newtown. Um, Newtown is a really uh, wealthy part. Not, so it's not wealthy by the fact that the people living there have a lot of wealth. It's wealthy in that the land itself can generate a lot of profits for capitalists. People who want to you know, capitalize on the tourism industry in Sarasota um, and people who are moving, rich people are moving to Sarasota, old rich people, usually old rich white people moving to Sarasota. This is land that can be used to build houses, to be used to build shops. Um, so that's all they see here. So they push out the people from Newtown by over-policing them. Um, you can see a direct um, example of this in the way that uh, Newtown has the most police cameras. Um, I think Newtown has like 70, 60 percent, 80, it's a, it's a large number of all the police cameras in all of Sarasota. So the police are concentrating most of their efforts in Newtown. Um, and also the, the reason we know that there's a bunch of um, police cameras in Newtown and that that's not everywhere else is because people decided to research the information and figure out what was happening. That wasn't presented to us, so a lot of things in our fight for revolution are things we have to research ourselves, we have to find the information ourselves. So that's one of those things, um, you know, the police cameras there. Um, there's also a lot more police cars, a lot more um, <clears throat> patrolling of this area, and a lot of people want to make the argument out of ignorance or out of hate that police are mostly in Newtown because uh, it's a community where there's more crime. A lot of people associate blackness with crime, and that's not because black people are inherently more criminal, it's because we live in a system where media that criminalizes black people is, we see it all the time. Um, and it's something that's been going on for years and generations. So it's something that we've been taught um, and it's not actually inherently true. Like what, why would having more melanin make you more prone to crime? I mean, I mean, there, there's some things we can unpack with that. Whereas, you know, people of color are pushed out of, um, a lot of institutions in society where they can create wealth for themselves. So sometimes they do have to turn to things that are criminal um, because that's the only way they can put food on their table. Um, but I also want us to think about a lot of things that are criminalized in our system, um, in, our, in our society, that aren't necessarily criminal. Um, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and say weed should be legalized. A lot of drug dealers, a lot of people who smoke weed are in prison, being policed, being harassed by the police. They're doing nothing wrong. Weed um, I can make another video about why we should be legalized, but you, if you, you know, research that, there's so much on that. But yeah, so, uh, people who involve themselves with me, people who involve themselves with, sometimes, you, sometimes we gotta steal to get what we need because it's not coming to us, and people are, like, creating barriers for us to get those things. Um, so, you know, I'm not gonna say people who steal are bad, I'm not gonna say people who, um, you know, have to use underground means of getting money are bad. Um, it's because we've been pushed into that because our society doesn't have, doesn't accept us into um, other spaces, um, like academia. Like think about how many how many black teachers have you had? Unless you're like, even in black communities, how many black teachers do you have? 
Um, how many black professors do you have? How many black doctors do you have? How many black, uh, you know, there's a lot of places where black people, it's not because we're not smart enough, it's not because we don't want to, it's because society has, you know, conditioned us through media to say that we don't belong in those positions or have actively created barriers for us to get there. The educating um, in poor and black communities is usually not on the same level as education in white communities or wealthy communities. Um, this is something I experienced personally. I could do another video about my personal experiences with this, but you know, uh, the black community where I originally went to school at, in Atlanta, um, I, was, I had straight A's, I was doing great, but then I transferred to an all white school and suddenly I, was, I, was, I had C's, I wasn't doing very well at all. I could barely communicate with the people because there's like a language divide too. Um, so there's all these barriers that were set up to, to make sure that I had more chances to fail. There's obviously, you know, some opportunities, but there's a lot of barriers too. There's a lot more barriers for people of color. That's what I, that's what I want to say. You know, there are some successful piece of people of color, but like, they have to go through a lot more to get to that position. Or it's also like, um, more unlikely that they will get to that position. And that's something we should acknowledge. Um, it's not inherent with being black. It's just like, what happens when you live in a system that targets black people and people of color. Um, women, etc. Um, so yeah, that's something I wanted to point out. Um, I also want to, you know, really add some realness to this talk. Uh, in Sarasota specifically, um, the police, you can see examples of police brutality and how the police side against the people of color and the police officer Brandon Vermillion. Brandon Vermillion is a police officer who is still employed in the Sarasota Police Force. Um, and he is protected by his chief, Chief Tapino, who even remarked that he was, you know, I don't know what exactly she said. Basically, she was saying he was great, he was doing a good job. Um, this is um, her response to um, activists and organizations uh, doing work to draw attention to the way Brandon Vermillion is actually not being a great guy. Um, some examples of this are his interaction with um, the man Chad Washington. Chad Washington is a father. Uh, I think he's a husband. Uh, he he's just you know just a you know he's a, he's a just some guy who's existing. And I think what happened was um, you can research the story to get more into it. But there's a lot of articles about it. A lot of militant journalism articles about it. We got to start talking about our own stories. So militant journalism is something I want to uplift just for a second. Um, if you see a problem in your community, write an article about it. Document it. We have to do that ourselves because the media is not going to do it for us. But anyway, um, Chad Washington was a man who um, his his wife um, his, or his partner called the police to um, I think she called the police to get help with him because he was having a seizure and he needed medical attention. Actually, she didn't even call the police. She called an ambulance. The police showed up, not the ambulance. Um, so that's something we should think about too. Why is it that when someone from a, um, when a person of color from a poor community calls the police, calls the ambulance, the police show up? That's not by chance. A lot of police officers showed up and they proceeded to, they barged into the house. Um, so they didn't, you know, do the whole thing where, you know, hey, let us come in. You know, police are not like vampires. You do not have to invite them in. But sometimes they just come in. So that's something that we have to face. Um, but anyway, the police came in, they started brutalizing this man, uh, they tased him, his children were watching, this is all on footage, so don't believe me, there's footage, it's pretty gruesome, but yeah, they tased him, um, and brutalized him, and he's, I believe he's still in prison now, Chad Washington is there, I think they said that he, like, resisted arrest, even though he was having a seizure at the time, um, and obviously he might want to defend himself against the multiple people who are beating him and tasing him, but whatever. He's in jail now still, and I want to flip that because we're still trying to draw attention to that issue. We want to get him free, get him back to his family, get him back with his children. His story is not unique. There are a lot of black fathers, a lot of people in prison, a lot of, a lot of black mothers um, there for self-defense. Um, you know, it's ridiculous. So that's something I want to point out. There's also another story um, regarding Brandon Vermillion. There was this um, boy called, his name is Jeremy Trebles. And he was recently um, abused by Brandon Vermillion. He was simply sitting in a car with his three friends, or two friends, and Brandon Vermillion uh, proceeded to somehow interpret the car as a threat. 
and he pulled out his gun at the car and he ended up shooting through the car and wounding um, Jeremy Troubles. Uh, Jeremy Troubles was also um, arrested for resisting arrest, even though he was probably trying to save him and his friends' lives. I'm so glad that he um, was able to survive the attack. Um, and this is all happening like near his graduation, near his like college applications. Uh, I think he was a senior in high school. So this, these things have real impacts on people's lives. Like when you get jailed by the police, not that you just have to go to jail. Like you have, you lose your job, you lose connection with your family, you lose um, connection to a lot of resources. So like being arrested is not just being arrested, it's a pretty impactful experience. Um, and you know, Jeremy Trebles was hospitalized and his mom wasn't even allowed to see him for a long period of time. Um, yeah, so I just wanted, you know, please look up Jerry Trebles, please look up Chad Washington, talk about them, um, share the articles about them. We're still trying to fight to get these people free. Also, um, there's ways that you can send money to help these people get out of um, jail or help them with their court fees. I don't know exactly those links, but I think if you were to, if you were to contact the Party for Socialism and Liberation in Florida, um, the Sarasota chapter, they have a Facebook page. I think that's a good way to interact with them. Um, if you were to contact them, you could find a way to get money to them because we've been working with them, with them and having campaigns to raise awareness about that. Um, so yes, uh, I want to talk again about how police forces are created to oppress people and how they serve the interests of the state. I'm almost done guys. Uh, just two more points I want to hit before I end this video. I know it's long. If you, if it's tiring, come back to it. That's all I can say. I don't want to make a whole bunch of different videos because I don't have time for that. I'm painting all the time and that's just a lot of work that I don't have the energy for right now. Hopefully I will someday, but you know, please you know, keep, pause it, come back to it, whatever you need to do, um, I want to get this information out there, um, because maybe you need it right now, maybe you need to hear this, so here it is for you. Um, so the police forces are created to oppress people. I know I talked about how the police originated as slave catchers and the slave patrol, um, and how they're used by the state, but I want to go further into how they're used by the state. Um, okay. So, you know, I've honestly gone pretty deep into how they're used by the state. I'm sure you are, you know, at this point, introduced to a lot of, you know, perspectives that you can look into that, you know, prove that the police are a, are a tool by the state to oppress people. Um, but I want to talk again about how, um, let's see. Okay, so something I want to touch on is how it's important for us to have these conversations about police. Um, and I think it's important for us to start thinking about police. Obviously, you know, don't let it overwhelm, you don't let it, you know, scare you too much. But it's important to talk about this because it's a real issue that we face. And if you're look listening to this video from the perspective of like an activist, abolitionist, freedom fighter, um, communist, socialist, whatever you want to call yourself, um, the police are going to be your greatest barrier to um, are going to be one of your greatest barriers to liberation. And we can see examples of this, um, especially in America, throughout time, um, specifically with the Black Panther Party. Uh, the Black Panthers were targeted by CIA, which I consider, you know, similar to the police, at the, it's an institution used to oppress people of color. Um, but yeah, the CIA, the police, etc., um, you know, targeted the Black Panthers because they knew that the work they were doing was uplifting people, and it was, um, you know, giving people the tools they needed to regain, regain power. Um, so one of the members of the Black Panther Party that I want to talk about is Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton um, has got incredible speeches, incredible um, things to say, so look up Fred Hampton if you don't know about him. But he was a black revolutionary who um, really, he had, he had a great focus on how regardless of our race, regardless of um, certain identities we may have, it's important for us to all see ourselves is a part of the mass group of people that the state is oppressing and how we need to work together to, you know, secure our future. Um, that message was so powerful that the police or the, you know, the CIA or whatever, uh, ended up killing him and, uh, he did it in a really brutal way where he was like in his own bed. Um, they like, 
got they got people who were close to him to reveal like the you know the blueprints of his house and where he was going, what he was doing, so that they could do it without him having a chance to defend himself. So they did it in his sleep. Um, and I think his pregnant girlfriend was next to him. You can research that, see if it's true. That's something I heard, and it's definitely something we should you know consider that they would do something so cruel. Um, so yes, uh, the police target um, people who are on this path. Um, and also, you just you should know activists like, get arrested at protests. Activists get arrested at direct actions. Um, organizers, you know, are constantly being put into the prison system. As I talked about in another video, it's the prison system is used to hold political prisoners to serve as a tool to scare people from organizing. Um, but my goal is not to scare people. I just want to I want to tell us that it's okay and important to address the things that are oppressing us and to see them clearly and that we don't we don't need to shy away from discussions about this it's super important if you have a weird opinion about the police don't just have that weird opinion that people keep challenging you on like realize why you have that opinion um you know deconstruct it and realize what's actually uh you know going on like use logic like the whole you know the phrase there are there's so much we could say about this people who tend to consider that some police officers are good or blah 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 and I'm just gonna say again there's no way to be an active duty police officer and be aligned with fighting for justice and there's no way to be an ally to police officers and also be an ally to the people who are being oppressed so you know think about that um, also I want to make sure that we are becoming more aware of the militarization of police um, the increased presence of police how there's so much investment going into police. Uh, you may notice that in your city, your neighborhood, um, a lot of the funds that the uh, you know political structures have is going towards police, um, and that's not accidental. Um, they're realizing that people are starting to fight back more, um, and they're putting a lot of money into making sure that we're not successful. But if we're aware of it, if we're actively trying to counter it, then you know we can be successful. So I also want to talk about um, how police are being increased, their presence is being increased on schools and campuses. Uh, you may notice that there are police in cafeterias now. Growing up, I remember there were like two police officers in my school maybe, um, but I realize now that that's not the case for a lot of people. There's a lot more. Um, and you know they're actually starting to arrest people in school on college campuses for like minor things. Um, you know, and that's something that doesn't have to happen. We can get them off of our campuses. Like, at the end of the day, uh, especially college campuses, we put our money into it. So if we are the ones to stand up against what's happening, then we are we can we can make that change. Um, we just have to do it. We have to actually put work into it. And deciding to put work into our well-being, liberation of people is a really powerful thing. So the more you decide to do it, um, the better off you will feel, um, I'm sure the better your life will go, so, you know, stop not prioritizing action and doing this type of work because it's a priority and the more we make it a priority, the more successful we'll be. Um, so I just want to end this video um, on why I said that we need to arm ourselves against the police. Um, we need to arm ourselves with this knowledge of what the police are, um, the history of the police. We need to arm ourselves with an understanding of like why they're doing what they're doing, who they're serving, why their allies have these perspectives on them. Like these are, this knowledge is really important. That's something we can arm ourselves with. In addition, I think we need to arm ourselves with protection. And that protection can take many different forms. Um, it For some people, protection might just be avoiding the police. Like you see the police go the opposite direction um, there's a chance where the police is trying to like, might, you know, just like don't run from the police. That's super dangerous, especially if you're a person of color. But um, you know, actively try to not interact with or be around police as much as possible. Um, and then also make sure you surround yourself with maybe um, some protection too. Like if you're a person of color, um, I don't know. Hopefully, I hope you have like some kind of barrier to the police. Maybe you could find someone who is less of a threat to the police, such as like a white person. And it, I don't know, if you're really afraid of this, like this is something you can do. You can travel with someone who um, may have a better time or easier time 
talking to the police so that the police aren't directing all their attention towards you or um, you know feeling like they can just do whatever they want to you arming yourself with you know your camera police seem to not like being um, photographed or recorded that's something you can do um, and also arming yourself in general like I know this is controversial but like we have to understand what we're, what what is out there and when we aren't armed and they are armed consider who is who has more power in that situation um it's just a fact it's just a fact like their revolution um standing up for yourself self-defense all that those are things that are not necessarily peaceful um they never really have been in a successful way um so you know look at like what's happened in the past and look at how people in black communities managed to take power back into their um their uh the community. So there's a great story about Newtown where originally the police, you know, they were doing, I think it was actually KKK, and they were, um, you know, the people of Newtown had to scare the KKK out of their community. How they do it? Arming themselves. They all, you know, they got, they, they felt that courage, they felt that unity, and they stood up and they faced the KKK as they were coming to their community. And, you know, they said, you know what, you're, you're not going to, um, you know, harass and kill our people without losing some of your own people. And uh, you got on, I mean, this is, I'm, I know this stuff is, is hard, but police, Nazis, KKK members, white nationalists, they're cowards. They're cowards. So when you um, arm yourself, when you get powerful, when you have courage, it scares them. So the more you do it, the better. Um, they're feeling really empowered right now because they have this, um, this white nationalist in, um, as a president right now. And he, there's like a lot of white nationalist movements that are happening around the world. So they're feeling pretty invigorated by that. But there's also a lot of really incredible revolutionary movements happening right now. A lot of people are beginning um, and continuing this fight. Um, and, you know, so we have to, you know, tap into that power because they're tapping into it. And, you know, I'm sorry, that's something that we can do. And if you're not comfortable with it, there's other ways you can avoid this stuff. But you're comfortable with it, like, um, embrace that, like, Learn how to protect yourself. Try and teach your friends how to protect themselves. You know, learn what you can do. I'll, pick, I'll make another video on that later. Um, but yeah, um, so I just want to end this video on how important it is to know yourself. Um, if you're a person of color, know how the world is viewing you. Know how police are viewing you. Know how the system is um, systematically working to oppress you. And knowing that is how you can begin to um, fight against it. It's also knowing that is how you can begin to um, keep yourself out of tricky situations. Like as a person of color, it's really smart to avoid the police because you know how they're viewing you. Um, so that's important. And also it's important to know our enemies. So it's important to do this research, understand who our enemies are. If you're a socialist, communist, revolutionist, revolutionary, abolitionist, etc., the, the, the enemy is the police. That's a fact. That's a bold fact. That's all it is to it. Um, if you're an ally, you know, you have to have, you have, the police have to be your enemy too. And don't call it, stop being an ally. Stop it. Be a revolutionary. Like, really commit to this. Like, allies is kind of a silly title because it just means that you're basically like trying to, I don't know, it's like you're co-opting this movement even though you're not doing the work. You're like, oh, I associate positively, positively with this movement. I want to take that as a part of my identity with actually doing the work that comes with that identity. So don't just be an ally, um, go for it, um, research things, understand like what you align with, what movement work you can do, uh, and that movement work is going to have to involve some type of addressing or countering of the police. Um, might, maybe not right now, but eventually, like that's something, that's where we're going. So being aware of that is important. Uh, yeah, so I just want to end the video on that note. Um, feel powerful, you are, when we work together, we're the most powerful. Um, you're not alone. Uh, don't be scared, but be knowledgeable. Like, it's scary, it, you know, it's, it's okay. I feel a lot of fear all the time, but I can't let that take over me. I can't let that keep me from doing what I'm supposed to do because that's what they want. So that's what I want to get into in this video. Um, hope you like, you know, what I was able to do for you today. Uh, you know, definitely feel free to reach out to me. Uh, if you're a Nazi, you want to send me some hate, I block all of it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Don't even, don't even try it. I block it. I don't even interact with it. But if you're someone who wants to learn more, interact with me, DM me um, on Twitter at human leech, human underscore leech. 
Um, if you want to see more of my artwork, if you want to commission me, this is how I make my money, this is how I support myself. Uh, so, uh, go, you can go to at lethal underscore lolita on Instagram. That's where I post all my artwork. That's where I keep my keep people updated on what I'm doing. So reach out to me there. Uh, I just want to uplift uh, the Forge news and what they're doing and how they're giving um, people a platform to talk about these issues. Um, so if you're interested, I don't, reach out to the Forge, uh, learn more about what they're doing. If you have some help that you want to give us or help that you want to do, like some there's something you want to report on, something you want to teach about, like we all have knowledge, we're all learning, so there's something you have to share too, reach out. So anyway, that's the end of the video. Uh, the next one I want to do, I think it's going to be on women's liberation. Um, I have a really cool piece painting that I'm working on for that, so it'll be on the background too. Um, but yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, you know, stay smart, uh, stay safe. I don't know what my ending phrase is going to be yet, so it's still a work in progress, but that's it. That's it.